Thank you all. Wherever you are on the eating spectrum, you are very welcome. I have, whoa, I have chosen this way, but I don't expect that anybody else chooses this. But I am so thrilled and delighted to share my experience, my joy, my love of this way of eating and then to be available as a resource person to anybody who's wishing to make some change. So this evening what we hope to do is, uh, I'll be doing much of the presenting, Margaret and I will both share our stories about how we got on this path. We'll talk about the various reasons for moving more toward a plant-based or plant-strong or plant-powered way of eating and then uh, have some interactive exercises available. Then talk about some of the practical, how you get started on this path. Now, some of you have been on the path for a long time. But what we're going to be doing is we'll break into some groups, perhaps, depending on how things go, and would love to have some pairing of people who've had a little bit of experience with it, along with some who have not. So that's what we're up to for the evening. And I see it sort of as my main mission in life to share this path of eating that's healthy for me as an individual, that's healthy for the living, other living beings of the planet, and that's also really important for the planet. And we're here this weekend celebrating Mother Earth and the care that we can provide to the Earth. And eating a plant-strong or plant-based diet is one of the most powerful actions that we can take in that arena. So that's what I, I want, and uh, Margaret will get to share her part of it. My story is that uh, my husband and I, and this is my husband, Keith, love to eat. We are foodies. And we used to eat any and everything and loved it, loved just about anything. And then we went to a class at our church where somebody was sharing about a plant-based diet. And we saw a very powerful, wonderful video called Diet for a New America. And that was by John Robbins. It was made into a PBS program, maybe 30, almost 30, well, 25, 27 years ago. And it was powerful, but we really didn't quite do anything with it. And then on May 5th, Cinco de Mayo, 23 years ago, next week, I was at work. I worked in the health department. I'm a public health professional. And we were having a potluck where I was eating a beef taco. And one of the doctors in our program came up to me and she said, Marge, I thought you were an environmental person. I thought you were aware of environmental issues. I'm really surprised you're eating meat. Well, I felt like somebody had just kicked me in the gut, <coughs> catching me on doing something that I shouldn't be doing. And I, did, I knew a little bit about the environmental link, but not very much. So after that Cinco de Mayo party, we did a little research, some talking to people, learning more about it. And one week later, sitting at the kitchen table, we said, you know, we have to put our values into action. If we really want to care for our own health, and I knew about health issues as a public health person, uh, and our environmental issues, we had to make a change. So we did overnight almost literally. We had a little bit of Parmesan cheese left in the refrigerator. We figured we'd finish that. We had a turkey in the freezer. Well, I wasn't going to eat that turkey at that point. And so we gave it to a neighbor, and we got on the path all of a sudden and immediately felt the wondrous uh, effects, mentally more than anything, spiritually felt like we were on a path of a great deal of heart, and we loved it right away. Now, not everybody loves it right away. And at that point, 
I still didn't know anything about animal rights issues. I wasn't very sensitive to the plight of uh, the way animals are raised. That wasn't of concern to me. It was a combination of the environmental issues and the health issues. But that started us on a beautiful path of learning. And I have found that one of the most powerful ways for me to stay on this path is to continually watch videos, read books, talk to people, try new recipes. So it was something that uh, I needed continual reinforcement. And I found it really valuable to have a partner doing it with me. So one of the things that I really recommend as I interact with people is that they join with somebody else. It's fantastic to see family members here together. We can support each other in a family. We can have friends. We can have monastics. I am so happy to have found a place here at Deer Park where I can act on my spiritual values and where my eating style is honored and they make fabulous food. So I don't ever feel any shortage when I'm here. Whereas when I've gone on a workshop or a retreat someplace else, it's always been a struggle and I have to lug my own food. So when we went plant-based, we went all the way. We choose not to eat meat, milk, cheese, butter, eggs, any of that, and I am not perfect. I see no need to be 100% perfect. In the theoretical world, that would be nice, but the reality is Sometimes we're eating someplace where there's cheese in a potluck dish and there isn't another option and for a main course, so I eat a little. Or when we've traveled sometimes and have been honored to be served some food that has some meat or dairy in it from somebody else, there have been occasions where I eat it. But overall, I make plant-based choices and in our home, we're completely plant-based. And I am loving what I have discovered by being plant-based. First of all, I didn't like to cook. I never liked to cook until I became plant-based. And then all of a sudden, there's this enormous array of foods that I didn't know anything about, vibrant colors. When you compare a piece of meat to a dish with lots of peppers and uh, green leaves and yellow corn and red beans. It's so vibrant. So I have discovered cooking. And that's been a nice outcome. And then so many more food options than I ever knew would be possible. Uh, I'm also able to eat almost anything I want and not put on a lot of weight as long as I don't add all the desserts that I would love to add. Uh, desserts can be laden with a fair amount of fat and sugar, so I, I can't just eat to my heart's content that way. But I can with fr fresh fruits and dates and nuts, so I'm able to still eat abundantly and not have the weight issue. I lost more than 50 pounds. Uh, Starting at the time when I went plant-based, my cholesterol dropped down to 124. Uh, my arthritis that had been bothering me went away. I went through menopause, clear sailing. There, was, there were no hot flashes. There was a little bit of a warm glow sometimes, but no hot flashes. So there were enormous benefits for me that way. And people who tend, to, I mean, who choose a plant-based way of eating tend to have much lower uh, rates of heart disease, the number one killer in our culture, less diabetes, less, fewer strokes, less Alzheimer's, less kidney disease, less uh, macular degeneration, less uh, of just about any of the diseases that afflict particularly this culture, but also any other cultures that eat a fair amount of uh, animal-based products. So it's something that's very healthy for us. And in a few minutes, I'll tell you more about the 
environmental joys. But I want to turn to Margaret and let her tell you her story. Hi. <clears throat> so my story started a really long time ago. <clears throat> it, was, uh, it was like 1992 or three. I went to a yoga ashram. That's where I used to practice yoga in Queens in New York. And they had a female guru from India. And people there were vegetarian. It really was my first exposure to people that were vegetarians. But they, they still ate dairy. <clears throat> and at that time, they said to me, it would be advantageous if you uh, tried to eliminate meat from your diet for your health. They said, you know. And, and there, they said to me, why don't you just put your meat on one side of the plate? So I said, so just start putting your meat over there. Don't mix it with the other food. Just give it its own space. So I did that, and eventually, after eating that way for a while, I didn't desire the meat anymore. Yeah. And I also attribute that to my mother was just like a terrible cook. She was a terrible Irish cook, and meat was just never cooked like I would imagine it would be from somewhere else. <laughs> so it, it wasn't like I was attached to the meat. I just ate it because that's what we ate, you know. So like I didn't know any other way. So, so eventually I just stopped eating the meat. <clears throat> and I still did eat this one uh, favorite food because it was where I lived on Long Island, duck, you know, ducks. So they were a delicacy type of food, and they were just crispy and had orange sauce and wild rice and it was just something that you just looked forward to having because it was so tasty that's the way i used to think it was so tasty and even though i didn't eat meat for so long every once in a while i would eat that and one time i even ate it and i felt really bad after i ate it you know but i still kept that as something that i did you know and i ate fish and i ate dairy and I didn't really give the animals so much any thought in the process. It was just about the health at that point. Like, oh, well, I don't eat meat, and you know, that's, I know that meat's bad. And I didn't really think about the animals in that equation. And I, I wonder why, because I always loved animals so very much, and I care so much for them. Go out of my way to kiss every dog that I see and, you know, pet every animal, pet every cat, and I'd rescue everybody if I could. So I don't know why I didn't consider them, but I didn't. And then one day I was driving down the road, and I was on the Long Island Expressway in New York, and I got stuck in traffic. And right next to me was a truckload of ducks, mm -hmm. and they were on their way to get to slaughter. And I could hear them crying, and I could see their feathers, and I felt their stress. And I felt super bad, like, because I knew that they were on their way to die because of me. There was no other reason except that I would eat them, so that's, there was a market, and there they were. And so from then I stopped eating duck. But I still ate dairy, and I still ate fish, and I went along just like that. And then it wasn't until uh, last summer, actually. So we're talking a long time, 1992 till last summer. And last summer, my husband, who was the primary cook in our house, um, when, I, when I was younger and I wasn't married to this husband, and I had two small children, and I did all the cooking. But then later on in life, when they grew up and left, I didn't do any cooking, and this man came into my life and he cooked. So whatever he cooked, basically I ate, except minus the meat. And uh, last summer, he got sick. He got pneumonia, and he couldn't cook. And so I had to start cooking. And also, at that very same time, I got to see this documentary series called The Truth About Cancer. I don't know if anybody's ever seen it, but you should definitely look it up. And it was an eye-opening event to see this series. It was like nine nights in a row. And every night, they had all these different health professionals on, and they were talking about all the diseases that we get from diabetes, arthritis, cancer, all these different cancers, because basically these are really modern diseases. <clears throat> and all in all, they talked about every single one of them was like plant-based. Get plant-based, and you can reverse these terrible things and possibly never even have any of these effects. 
So I started taking over the cooking and not being a cook, I just went and found simple books. I found uh, this book called uh, Skinny Joe's from Trader Joe's. Very easy, it's like five ingredients in each dish. I was like, okay, that's, that's manageable. <laughs> I could do five ingredients. And then, like Mart said, the more you start to cook these different foods, the more, and they come out really great, so surprising <laughs> and tasty. And then once you start finding that you can actually cook things that are really delicious and tasty, it's not that hard to make the switch, you know? And I was lucky to have Marge in a nearby sangha, and she gave cooking classes and all of that. But it's really been a, a big learning curve. And now recently, Mao, so I had stopped eating meat back in 1990s, in the early 90s, but my husband didn't. My husband would eat meat, and he would eat less meat because he was married to me for the last three years. But he would eat meat, and he was the type of guy that he would say, oh, if we went out somewhere, he would go get that meat. Or if we went to a barbecue and there were other options around, he wouldn't care, he'd just go get that meat or that dairy or, you know. And then he would say, oh, everything in moderation, everything in moderation. So then, not that long ago, uh, we went to the doctor and we found out he has uh, some serious heart things. He has plaque in his arteries and part of his heart valve. And now it's another world. Now this has become critical now. This isn't just like, oh, well, I feel like doing this or not feel like doing it. He uh, realizes now this is what you have to do. And the evidence is there to support it. There's actually lots of documentation that says if you stop eating the meat and you eliminate these certain fats out of your, you can reverse heart disease. You can, you know, you can cure yourself of different diseases and cancers and things. And so it's been an interesting ride. And so far, uh, I think we're doing pretty good. I just got a little app on my phone. It's called the Happy Cow app. And so when you travel places, you can hit the Happy Cow app and type in where you are, and it will tell you vegan and vegetarian restaurants and options near you. And it's surprising. I mean, we were in the middle of nowhere just two days ago, and we found a great vegan restaurant. Perfect. You know, cheap, out in the middle of nowhere. It was, so it actually works. Uh, because in the past, I felt like you go to a restaurant and you, you look at the menu and there really isn't anything on there. And then I was raised uh, the youngest of six kids. So you didn't really ask for things if it wasn't on the list or <laughs> it wasn't being provided. You didn't ask for it. So, you know, a lot of times I'm like, oh, well, there's nothing there. I guess I'll eat the dairy or, you know. But now I'm learning that if you ask and you say, uh, you know, there's really nothing here for me. Would you, would you mind if um, you just grilled me up some vegetables or you did this? They seem really happy to do that. It gives them some kind of creative license to, to actually make food that's tasty and good, and you're not going to get the same old bland thing that everybody else is getting with the fat. So I've been uh, very surprised, uh, pleasantly surprised. And... I'm actually turning into a really good cook, which is fun, <laughs> you know, and I don't mind. And I found really f easy ways to do things, like you just wake up in the morning, say, I make unchicken salad now out of sunflower seeds. So I go out in the morning, and I put my sunflowers in a bowl, and I soak them. Then I go out and do my exercise and yoga, or whatever I do. I come back in the afternoon, put it all in the food processor, and then we have lunch. Everything is a lot easier than I thought it was. I just didn't know how to go about any of the things. So it's, it's not as hard as you think. And I think a lot of it, for me, is the emotional things. So it's hard to give up the emotions. You know, just like I was attached to eating the duck because uh, it was this, like, special event type of thing, that, you know, that feeling of family and friends, <laughs> celebration. And... A lot of the things, I think, are tied to our emotions. But once we give them up, we realize that it really isn't the food. And uh, it's, so it's been very interesting, and I'm happy to be on this path. And uh, 
I think we're doing okay because we went to the doctor. He had all these health issues, and then um, we went back, and nothing is being done immediately. So that's a good sign. That means that we're on the right path and just keep going, and maybe it'll all work out for him. I mean, thank you. Thank you. It's inspiring to me to hear her. So I need that constant reinforcement. Spiritually, I've made a real shift in becoming plant-based. And even more so since I've started coming to uh, this practice. I find that because I eat at least three times a day, sometimes more, I have to admit, that I am bringing my values into line with my actions. My spirit feels nourished that way. I know that I am contributing to the health of the animals now, which I hadn't been sensitive to, be sensitive to before. The numbers of animals' lives that I know I am saving now makes me feel joyous, uplifted. And I, I didn't feel too sensitive with animals before, but now, if I come upon a cow, I just want to get down and look at the face and uh, looking at a chicken and listening to it and seeing the actions and the dancing around and the pecking. Now I can delight in the life of so many more beings than I ever did before. And I find that very uplifting. I also see that food is a gift from the earth. And if I can take the items that are being grown without having to take the life of something, then I feel that much more at peace with the choices that I'm making. Our Buddhist practice also has a number of lessons for me, specifically Buddhism. And the first of the precepts that the Buddha offered to the world was do not kill. He didn't say do not kill uh, lizards and snakes, but go ahead and eat fish and lambs and cows and so forth. He said do not kill. And so for me, that, that's a big reminder of why it's nice to go plant-based. In our first mindfulness training, the one on reverence for life, it says, aware of the suffering caused by the destruction of life, I am committed to cultivating the insight of interbeing and compassion and learning ways to protect the lives of people, animals, plants, and minerals. I am determined not to kill, not to let others kill, and not to support any act of killing in the world, in my thinking or in my way of life. So that's a guideline for me that I find works really, really well. I sometimes have people say to me, well, but you're killing the plants. Yes, I do have to eat, and I eat the food in reverence, just as we do here at the monastery. And I know that if I were eating the animal instead of the plant, I'd be eating 10 times more plants because the animal has to eat the plants. And then if I eat the animal, the animal has concentrated the, the nutrients, the energy. So I'm still eating far fewer plants than somebody who eats the animals. And then the fifth mindfulness training on nourishment and healing offers Aware of the suffering caused by unmindful consumption, I'm committed to cultivating good health, both physical and mental, for myself, my family, and my society by practicing mindful eating, drinking, and consuming. I will contemplate interbeing and consume in a way that preserves peace, joy, and well-being in my body and consciousness and in the collective body and consciousness of my family, my society, and the earth. So that's another reminder to me, to eat in a way that preserves health, not just my own health, but the health of my community and the health of the 
the other living beings. And I won't go through it all, but the 14th mindfulness training for those orders of interbeing members also talks about compassionate, healthy living. And our five contemplations ask us to eat in a way that protects life and reduces the, the chances of global warming. So that brings up the great joys of the environmental arena with plant-based eating. And I won't talk too much longer before we get you talking too. But my food choices allow me to live in much more harmony with Mother Earth when I'm choosing to eat the animal, I mean, not eat the animals. When I do my meditation in the morning and I see the lizards and occasionally a coyote walk through our yard and little rabbits, well, I realize that they are precious environmental issues as well. And I want to have that same kind of connection and joy of seeing uh, the other beings of the world by knowing that the cows and the pigs and the, the uh, fish also are being honored. I'm also able to use far fewer resources of the planet. You, are all, you must all be very environmentally sensitive or you wouldn't be at an earth holder retreat. And I've been able to learn through this process of becoming plant-based that I use so many fewer resources, much less land space to, to provide the food that nourishes me, much less water use, which is particularly of concern in uh, areas like California. We eat so much more water, consume much more water when we're eating animals, and so there's so much less impact on the, the water use here. There's a great deal less energy that's being used when you consume plants directly rather than having the plants eaten by the animals. And then the greenhouse gases, that's where I really feel like, wow, I am making the most important contribution I can to preventing global warming. The number one act that is more powerful than any other to reduce our impact on global warming is to consume the plants rather than the animals. Uh, the greenhouse gases, particularly the methane, released by the animals into the atmosphere really have a huge impact uh, on our global warming. And if we are cutting down rainforests to grow animal food to feed beef, then we're having too much impact. And so for me, taking the action of eating from the plant world is the powerful way that I think I can make an impact on reducing global warming. It's also been estimated that if a person is eating plant-based, that they, they do not eat 21 cows over their lifetime, 14 sheep, 12 hogs, 900 chickens, and 1,000 pounds of animals that either swam in the ocean or flew in the air. So if I'm not eating those, I am honoring Mother Earth and her creatures in a way that is almost uh, impossible to do in any other way. And if I'm getting my plant protein rather than animal protein, I'm able to save enough fuel for 10,000 miles of driving. 10,000 miles with a regular standard car or 20,000 miles with a Prius. So we're able to have all these beautiful effects on Mother Earth by simply, I say simply, knowing that it's not always simple, uh, by moving to a plant-based way of eating. I heard some really interesting stuff <clears throat> recently. So they were talking about their regular American diet. And they were saying that uh, kids that are born today and if they just go about eating their regular diet, by the time they're teenagers, they already have the beginnings of heart, uh, heart issues. And there's the diabetes and everything else like that. And that's only because of our diet. It's just our diet. And 
<clears throat> another thing I have read just recently, and uh, I have to look it up, but it was something called 10 Americans. And they did a study. They took uh, cells and blood from 10 fetuses in different parts of America and all the toxins that were in them. And it's not that, you know, from mercury, from the fish that their mother eats, or just everything, there's so much things. And they were saying the wheat, the wheat that we grow. So the, they were talking to this one person, they were saying, she, went to, she was a rancher and she went to somebody else's farm and she said, I was so marveled because there was no gophers on his ranch. And I said to him, wow, that's amazing. How do you not have any gophers? And he says, I, I don't even have worms. And, and they said, because the chemicals that they were putting were killing all this stuff, so it was helping this wheat grow. So they said, well, what are you doing with the wheat? Is the wheat going to feed animals? And in this case, his wheat was going into your whole grain breads. So you were absorbing all those chemicals that were going into the ground. And there's just so many things like that. We just are told, I think the biggest shock for me in the whole thing or of my awakening to the plant-based diet was how much we, misinformation we actually have been fed over the years about our, our standards. <clears throat> and recently, uh, one of them to me was, I went to get my cholesterol test, and the doctor said, I said, well, how's my cholesterol? And he said, well, there's the new standards and the old standards. And I said, well, what does that mean? And he started to explain, and then I said, well, which one is better? And he said, it's really a mute point. He said, even though they say that your cholesterol level is good, and he's a cardiologist, I don't want mine to be that. I want mine to be way down here. So we're told that there's good cholesterol and bad cholesterol, and we have good omega-3s and omega-6s, and there's different levels. But these things are not necessarily all the way that they were. So we had a, a ratio of one to one. Now they're saying, oh, well, you need more of this and less of this. No, we all need less of all of them. We need to get it all from our food. And once we start eating the plant-based diet, we find like all those levels go down. All those toxins, all those things, they want to leave our bodies, but we don't give them a chance because we ingest food that is eaten these chemicals. And to me, as much as I love the animals and everything, I think it's really uh, very important for me right now, and definitely for my husband right now, but I look at other people and I see young, young people out there, and they all have diabetes. And I've seen lately so many young men where I, they're in their 20s, and I see their legs like this, and I, and I know it's all the diet. It's all the diet. So there's so much information, it really is, but it's not, I think it's not as hard as we imagine. It really isn't as hard as we imagine. I think we make it seem like it's going to be a lot tougher. We'd like to have you interact a little bit with one another now. Uh, we have some questions that we'd like you to break into groups of three so everybody gets a chance to talk a little bit and then we can debrief a little bit about them. Uh, the questions are, and I'll give you some little slips with them, what seems appealing to you about eating a more plant-centered diet? What, what would allow you to consider it if you're not? or that keeps you going if you are? What are the barriers that prevent you from trying to move to a more plant-strong way of eating? Brainstorm with each other some ways to overcome those barriers. And what might you need from others, from your sangha or family or books or videos or friends, to help you make more of a transition to plant-based? So what I'd love to do is try to get somebody who's had a little more experience with some who haven't. So if we could, we kind of self-identified at the beginning. So if you could move into groups of three uh, to answer these. So I think we'll probably just have to turn off the uh, mics in a moment here. I want to pass those out. Yes. 
and hopefully we can continue some of these conversations over the rest of the weekend. And I know those of us who are already on the path, most of us probably feel fairly passionate about it and would be very delighted to speak with those of you who have questions. What I'd like to do is move into sort of the practical, how to get started. So some of you have been on the path for so long, this won't seem as quite as interesting to you, and yet maybe there will be something there for you. Would you be kind enough mm -hmm. to start those, please? Thank you. Do you want one? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> Now, somebody can move to a plant-based way of eating and be a junk food <laughs> eater, okay? You could eat white pasta, white rice, vegan cookies, uh, no fruits or vegetables, and still call yourself plant-based. Well, that's not quite the plant-based that we'd like. So the guidelines I'm going to suggest to you are for a healthier fare, but not the absolute healthiest. Because I'm of the belief, and there are many different approaches to this, that when you're starting to move to a more plant-based diet, you don't have to go 100%, be super strict, know about every vitamin and every mineral. There are some key things to know, but I wouldn't put a heavy burden on myself about having to have the perfect diet, which really doesn't exist anyway. So these are some guidelines. I'm going to talk about some what I call transitional foods, like veggie burgers, veggie hot dogs, uh, things like that, that I think have a role when you're starting to make the transition. And even I've been on the path for 23 years now, but I still like occasional veggie hot dog. When I go to a barbecue and everybody else is eating their hot dogs and they have mustard and ketchup and pickles and I bring my whole grain buns and my little tofu dogs and I still enjoy them. But I wouldn't suggest eating them every day or even every week. So I have given you a handout. I'll go through some of it. I'd rather you kind of listen to me but also take a look at what's there but then absorb it a little bit later. The basics are to try to eat as much whole plant foods as possible. Not a lot of highly processed, packaged foods. You could get by on eating all packaged foods and TV dinners, but that's not what I would suggest. Whole food that you get, you can tell. Oh, this is an orange. Oh, this is a beet. Not trying to guess what the food is. And lots of variety. That's one of the great benefits of this way of eating, is there's an enormous amount of variety. All different colors of the rainbow, too, because the more colorful the foods are, the more wonderful nutrients you're getting. Particularly a lot of beans and greens. Beans and greens, beans and greens, with lots of vegetables and fruits. Beans and greens are the two foods that will save you. Save your life, save the animals' lives, save the plants' lives, I mean the planet's lives. And there's something we call the fabulous four. If you turn to the second page, or fantastic four, I guess it's the third page. These are sort of the foods to use as the focal points of your diet. The first one, whole grains. And if a whole grain would be like brown rice or a whole oats, they could be rolled oats, they could be in what they call wheat, I mean oat berries, but something that's whole. And if you're buying a packaged food, you want to see whole written on it, not wheat flour. It's got to say whole wheat flour. And it's suggested that you try to get about five servings a day of some kind of whole grain. 
The second one is the legumes. These are the things like uh, beans, peas, tofu, lentils. It's a fabulous way to get plant protein. And they're loaded with lots of other things. They're whole foods that bring in carbohydrates, healthy carbohydrates as well. And to try to get two or more servings of legumes a day to meet your protein needs. We have no requirement for animal protein. We can get everything we need from plant protein. And then the third food group is vegetables. And there have to be hundreds of kinds of vegetables. The more, the merrier. And the more at any particular meal, the better for you. And suggest at least four a day servings. Well, nine is divine. 11 is heaven. So uh, the more you can get in, the healthier you'll be. And then lots of fruit. Aim for at least three different fruits a day. So that's sort of overall the basic diet. But then add in some nuts and seeds, avocados. You need some fat. But we don't need oil, but we need fat. And so the nuts, seeds, and avocados are wonderful sources. And then the other thing that's listed, I think, on the back on the front is that you need, if you are moving to a plant-based way of eating, to get vitamin B12. That's essential. It's uh, a vitamin that's critical to our nervous system, to our brain health, to a whole lot of things. So it's something that you probably have a storage built up for a while, but if you start eating mainly plants, B12 is really critical. And then to get you started on a plant-based diet, a lot of people are like, I don't even know where to start. I don't want that tofu-looking stuff. I don't want to eat lettuce and cucumbers till they come out my ears. The first time I started, I tried eating plain tofu stuck in a pita with some carrots and cucumbers. And I thought, if this is what eating plant base is about, I'm not going to last very long. Well, fortunately, we got turned on to other things. But start with what you already eat that are sort of your favorites and try to come up with some substitutions. Like if you like pasta, how many of you like pasta? Most, not all, OK. Well, try to replace the meat with some beans, mushrooms, vegetables, tofu, tempeh, throw something else in. You don't have to make an absolute switch on everything. Or if you like burritos, uh, somebody was saying carne asada burritos, well, change out the carne <laughs> and put in some beans, some vegetables, some uh, rice, brown rice. Yeah, so there are many things you can substitute. But start with something that's a little familiar and make some change on it, rather than have to go all out, having everything completely different at first. I found a really easy way to, if you like make spaghetti and you want like meat sauce, you can use walnut. So mm -hmm. you just chop up the walnuts and put it in with your sauce, and you think you're eating meat. It has the mm -hmm. same kind of texture. It's just that psychological thing. So it doesn't feel like so far and like, oh, I'm not eating it. You feel like you're eating the meat, so it works mm. out. Sounds good. I haven't tried that. <laughs> and then broaden your horizons. If you're eating the standard American fare and you've never tried Thai food, Vietnamese food, uh, Italian food, uh, try different culture, cultures' foods. So many of those cultures have far less emphasis on the meat or the dairy. And Indian food, there's a vast array of fabulous Indian food that has no meat or dairy in it. So try to start experimenting. And I found that by going to restaurants that offer plant-based choices, that helped me see what was possible. Then I could look up some recipes. So we don't have to stay with what's always familiar, but check out some new things. And you know what I found, too? Like, what did I make? Uh, I just made a carrot ginger soup today. Mm. 
and it was super easy. But I didn't put in some oil because, again, because my husband's trying to work on his heart. And it, even it was a, an earth balance that they were asking for. And I just left it out, and mm -hmm. it was fine. It tastes fine. Mm -hmm. So some of the things they recommend you don't really need. And then thanks to Marge, I actually learned that I don't need to cook, uh, I don't need to saute with oil. Big knowledge. I have no idea that that was even possible, that I could fry things with water. Who knew? <laughs> I mean, but, you know, no one ever told me that. And it's so simple. You just put the vegetables in. They have water in them already. They start to fry. And then as you need it, you just add a little bit of water, and you just cook it, and there, you don't have all that oil and all that extra fats. And it, you don't miss it. You know, but we never were taught that this was a possibility. Mm. And then in our group, someone was saying they bake, and that was another question. Well, what do you use for an egg substitute? Well, There's I egg substitutes on here. here. Yeah. So there are other options. It's just a little thinking out of the box. It's like changing your perspective, standing in a different corner of the room. Yes. The question was that if you, or the statement, if you add spices to food, that that'll jack it up, that sometimes if th something's too plain, then it may not be as appealing, but by adding spices, that'll help it. Go ahead. Excuse me, would you, could we have you use this then, please? That's just the one I didn't get it all the way. There we go. Um, just a comment on the B vitamins. Um, from, from my research, we need all the Bs, not just B12. So I take a B100 every day, and that's recommended definitely for adults. I found it changed my world once I started taking all the Bs, mm -hmm. not just B12. Thank Be you. complex. Yeah. And for just a, a general taking a look at what a plate would look like that's different, if you consider having half of your plate filled with different kinds of non-starchy fruits and vegetables, and then the other half with medium to high calorie dense foods like whole grains, beans, legumes, starchy veggies, so that you've got the things that are a variety of vegetables uh, that aren't very starchy, and then some that are starchy along with your protein, that you'll probably get a pretty complete way of eating. And then I'm just reading a book now called The Buddha, the Vegan, and You, a fairly new one, I think. And he's talking about using our Buddhist practice to help us with the cravings and desires of the meat. For years, I still wanted cheese. In fact, for a while, I still ate some pizza with cheese on it once a month for years. I let go of that many years ago. But to deal with those cravings, we are taught in our practice about impermanence and that you see things arise in your thoughts and you know they'll be there for a while, but you know that eventually they'll go back down. Or when you're trying to meditate and there's something that keeps bugging you, well, Welcome it, greet it, ah, I see you, thought, or I see you craving for meat or craving for cheese. I honor you, I understand you, I know where you've come from, and I know you'll go away, and so then just allow that to go away. So if we can try to use some of our Buddhist practice with dealing with our cravings, that that may be a way to help make the transition. And I'm uh, such a believer, I mentioned earlier, with teaming up with somebody else. It just makes all the difference in the world. Yes. I've actually had some really incredible cheese substitutes, too. Like fancy cheeses that you know, you'd bring to some sort of potluck or something like that. Um, the the more processed cheeses, substitutes, um, I'm a little sketched out by, but there's definitely a 
wide range mm. of what's available, and some of them are actually really good. Great, thank you for that comment. I think that's one of the things that people fear too, like when they're dairy people, they're like, oh, cheese. And, and you know, it is, it, is, it is a shift, it really is. And we used to have one woman that was around here quite a bit, Lori Houston, she was an animal activist, really, and then she came to the practice. And she was the only person I knew that could make really good vegan cheese. She was the queen. But it is, that is difficult. And that for me, I haven't mastered anything like that. I'll just use the uh, vegan substitutes right now. And maybe in the future, I'm still trying to get the cooking thing down. But you know, it's little, like I said, it's a learning curve, definitely sure. a learning curve. And there are sort of two approaches. There's the all at once approach that Keith and I used and it worked for us. But for other people, the gradual change process works better, where first they let go of the red meat and found some substitutions, and then let go of some cheese, and then let go of some eggs. So you have to look at your own lifestyle to see which might work better. The next page and a half I'm not going to talk about, I'm just going to point out, has some ideas for different kinds of breakfasts, lunches, and dinners. And I think if you could try some of those, you might find some that are kind of good. And then the last page, two-sided, has different dairy, egg, and meat substitutes. So this shows you some of the things that are available for different kinds of milks or ice cream or cheese substitutes. Uh, so if you're baking, you can usually make some good substitutions for eggs and dairy. Uh, describes the different kinds of things you can eat instead of meat. So I invite you to take these with you and go through them when you have time. And I think there's some good ideas that'll spark your thinking. But then the internet now is an extraordinary resource. Wow. I used to highly recommend people buy a bunch of cookbooks. Well, you can, some people love to sit and read cookbooks. If you love to do that, go for it. But you can now put into the computer plant-based eggplant parmesan or vegan parmesan. I tend not to use the word vegan very much anymore because I have had so many people so turned off by thinking that you all have, that we're all crazy, granola-loving, uh, Birkenstock-wearing, California crazies, mm -hmm. and that we are all so strict, and we are like the food police. No, 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 no. I don't want that. I want people to explore the delights and pleasures of plant-based eating. I'm not here to police anybody. I don't even police my mother or my sisters. Gratefully, I have family members who are in this practice who are also practicing this plant-based way. And we're really lucky here in Southern California. There's a million places to eat, and there's getting more and more. If you go other places in this country, even going back to New York, there's not a lot. I mean, on Long Island, I don't think there's anything. You know, you really mm. have to go out of your way. So here, we're very fortunate. We have a lot of options. So I find that this is uplifting spiritually. It's healthy for my own body. It allows the other beings of the planet to live their lives freely. It cares for Mother Earth. I don't know of any other lifestyle issue that has so many benefits. So I'm hoping some of you who aren't on the plant-based way yet could at least experiment. And I want to offer my support. I have my email and phone number at the bottom of all those pages. I love to respond to questions. Or if you're trying to figure out how you make a substitution, or where do you, what kind of stores do you shop in, or what resources are available online or in cookbooks, call on me. This is my thing. <laughs> so I'd like to know if there are any particular questions right now. We're going to tie it up at 9, and then we've been requested to, to uh, have 15 minutes of meditation. 
Great, thank you. Whoops, you've got a tail. <laughs> um, I'd like to have a plant-based diet that's really light in grains and soy. Um, are there other area, other, what other kinds of foods can I go to besides vegetables and fruits? And I already eat a ton of both of those and I probably eat too much fruit. <laughs> What other what's could you go to? Do you uh, what other types of food besides like um, grains and tofu, like soy based? I want to avoid the soy and most of the grains. Um, but the, the grains beef, or the greens? Grains. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Well, if you don't want the grains, are you okay with like corn, mm -hmm. potatoes, sweet mm -hmm. potatoes especially? Mm -hmm. Sweet potatoes are marvels of foods. Uh, but there are a number of the grains, are you trying to avoid gluten particularly? Or? No, I just read the, there's like a book called Grain Brain, and you know, they're very anti-grain, uh, avoiding it as much as you can. Um, so they're like, I mean, it's just interesting because there's like so many different schools of thought on the internet and like there's a lot of people who advocate the paleo diet and uh -huh. I don't really like that but I like the part in the paleo diet in that they avoid the grains. So I'd like, I'd like a meat-free paleo diet. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know the grains, the, the thing that I'm finding out with the grains is that, uh, and this goes to all of our food really, but if you eat organic foods and you eat, uh, and the reason you really don't want to eat the other foods, the GMO foods, and is we're not getting the nutrients out of them. So people tend to eat a lot more, and they eat and they eat and they eat, and they're not satiated, they're not getting the fulfillment out of them. But if you eat the whole grains and you eat the organic grains, you won't eat as much of those grains, and then you won't have what that so-called grain brain is, but there is a lot of misinformation about a lot of things. Um, I'll give you a very simple example, it's coconut oil. <laughs> coconut oil was, we would just, everyone's, oh, coconut oil, it's so good for you, eat coconut oil. So I think I really messed my husband up, actually, because I had gotten his cholesterol level nice and down, and all of a sudden I was like, coconut oil, everything's about coconut oil. And I was putting coconut oil in his coffee, and cooking with coconut oil, and his cholesterol level just went right up through the roof. And then I said, well, my cholesterol level never was high, so let me get my blood tested. And sure enough, mine is elevated. So there's a lot of misinformation, mm -hmm. and, and what you have to look at is who's funding this study? Who's mm -hmm. making the money? And it's always the same, it's the same in everything we do. It's <laughs> everything we do, not to go political, but you wanna follow the money. So wherever that study comes from, that drug company that's paying for this, whoever's paying for it, and the paleo diet is basically the same as the Atkins diet. It's just a new title <laughs> tacked on. So I don't think it's so much the grains. I think it's what, what kind of grains we're choosing. Mm -hmm. And unless you're gluten-free, then you know, that's a different story. I had mentioned in my group that you know, when I first went vegan, I experimented with a lot of things, and you know, it was a lot of trial and error as far as my health, because I did it for animal reasons. Um, and I actually finally went to see a, a registered dietitian who was familiar with plant-based eating, and I would really recommend that to anybody with any kind of you know, specific concern mm -hmm. to go to someone who knows about this particular style of eating. Mm -hmm. And everyone's system is so different that to get some sort of personalized advice, I think, is usually a good idea. And as you say, particularly someone who knows something about plant-based. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to recommend one um, grain that is, um, it's, it's an older grain and it's not very, I mean, it's not like rice, but you can look up amaranth. Um, it's a really, really old grain. Uh, it's gluten-free as well. Um, my problem with grains before was my, um, a lot of the grains nowadays have a lot of wheat, and they are GMO, and like there's a lot of Roundup and things that happen when it's being harvested. And um, the big difference for me was my skin. Whenever I would eat 
too much of it, like just over and over, I would get kind of like bumps, which I've never had skin problems before. And then later on, just learning, learning, cross-referencing, I finally found out it was a lot of it's a wheat. And then um, since then, whenever I do, I don't really eat much grains anymore. But when I have, it's been amaranth. But the only thing with amaranth is if you're used to like the rice, it's nothing like rice. It's almost like little dots. But as small as they are, they're very powerful, especially if you sprout them. So that's probably the only grain I would, that I know of that I would recommend um, if you're going to still eat them. Sorry? Amaranth. Amaranth. I believe it's A-M-A-R-Y-N-T-H. And you can find that at um, Sprouts, I believe. And there, there is a lot of variety of beliefs, but a lot of it's not founded, thank you, on science. And I am a proponent of a variety of whole grains. There are a lot of nutrients that are available in grains that aren't very available in other things. So I think a number of people who have gotten on the gluten-free bandwagon have done themselves a disservice by cutting out so many things. But there are differences in bodies, there are differences in value systems. So what I'm really promoting here is moving more to the plant world. And there are so many advantages. Any, any other questions? Great. Can we touch on specific ingredients like I'm, I'm reading about nut milks and soy milks and rice milks which have become really popular um, there's one very problematic ingredient in most of those called carrageenan and that I mean just put in carrageenan on Google and you'll see what I'm what I mean and they're in almost all of the the milks that aren't cow milk just very few brands don't have carrageenan, which is a thickening agent. I, I would agree. One that doesn't? <clears throat> I don't drink those anymore. I don't remember which are the brands that don't carry it. But, you know, it's listed on the ingredient list. Yeah, yeah I Car do drink one that isn't, but I can't tell you the name of it, but the bottle is shaped. It's like a shape. They have it at Sprouts and stuff, but you have to look for it. And, and they are charged, they do charge more money for it. Trader Joe's has... It's on sale actually now, it sprouts. But mm. Trader I Joe's has some. soy milk without carrageenan in it. Huh? There yeah. are a number of... There, there are, okay. Yeah. So you just have to be aware, but I agree that be it's better to it. be without it. Yes. And there are but people if, that make their own milk, but it's a process too. I mean, I'm not up to that myself yet, but... My concern right now with this conversation is we're getting into some details that are beyond the beginning, starting with a plant-based. When you're starting, a little bit of carrageenan in the milk or a little bit of gluten in something or soy or all of these, I would let go of any of that and just try to move to focus on fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes. Throw in some nuts, seeds, avocados and vitamin B12, and that's a beautiful start. That for those of us who've been on the path for many years, we can start refining it. But you will be so much healthier, hopefully happier, by doing it. I also want to say that avocado seeds are very good for you. That I don't know really? anything about. I don't know anything about that, so I can't comment. We, we, hmm. we're going to have to tie this up, but I'm so very happy you were all here and participated and stayed awake. That's pretty good at this hour. I thank my partner in this and as I say I'm available Margaret isn't able to be here the rest of this weekend thank you for coming over for it and what I'd like to do is have you get in a comfortable place for some meditation oh, thank you 
I have to say just one thing about Marge. If you do write her, she will write you back. <laughs> and she will give you substitutes and helpful hints. She's been really a great support. Thank so you. thank you very much.